so let's get on with um, the, the topic today, like we're working. So we're going to cover off um, what we talk about in terms of flexible work. We'll go back to basics a little bit because I'm not sure how many of you are work actually in a HR capacity. Um, so we'll just cover off a little bit about flexible working, uh, the importance of policies and contracts, um, what the process is, um, reasons that we might want to decline a request, what important considerations there are. And then we're going to move on to present day um, COVID. 19 how that's impacting businesses and flexible working and then towards the end of the session I'm just going to briefly touch on flexible working from a different angle and um, more from your for your own from a business perspective maybe having to implement a temporary change of terms and conditions or we might need to be considering um, layoff or short time working um, as a result of, of supporting that business change okay so what is flexible working? Well, you know, anybody um, can put in a flexible working request now since 2003. It's been there for a long time. Um, so anybody who um, has got 26 weeks service or more, it is a statutory right to request um, flexible working. So it's not a statutory right to have, but it's a statutory right to request it. Um, a process should be followed and that should be in line with ACAS. Um, code of practice but internally businesses that uh, may be a little bit more uh, mature from a HR perspective may have a family friendly policies in place and therefore there may be a flexible working procedure policy um, for you to follow. Um, when an employee is considering um, what they want um, I think that one of the big questions they really need to ask themselves is well can they still perform the role because if they can't then straight away we've got a bit of a problem so that is ultimately over in terms of what flexible working is. I mean, different companies will view flexible working differently. Um, more modern, maybe tech companies might have flexible working practices in place already through flexi systems, through working from home, um, etc. Where more structured businesses may be in the manufacturing sector those that require uh, customer service, telesales, that kind of thing, may require more of a structured setting and therefore flexible working might not be um, as easy to, to accommodate. Um, but we'll, let's, we'll move on and we'll talk about now um, the policies um, and procedures. So it's important to know, as we just said, you know, one size doesn't fit all. What works for one business isn't going to work for another. Um, and, and certainly there is no expectation for businesses to completely bend over backwards and to accommodate every single request um, where, you know, uh, where, where there's one put in. Um, but where possible, it should be accommodated um, and that will help from a diversity perspective, it will help with a retention and it will help with attracting talent as well. Um, any policy um, should comply with the ACAS code of practice. Um, and then something else you may want to consider as a business is whether or not you want to allow employees who actually don't qualify to submit flexible working requests and there are your new starters essentially. Now it would be hoped that if there were any concerns around um, their ability to do their hours that might be discussed at a recruitment stage but some people are a little bit reluctant to chance their arm a little bit to start causing problems before they're even through the door so it may well be that actually once they start working um, and they start um, working certain hours that, that might not necessarily work for them and then there's the choice of what not whether the business wants to um, consider the request. One thing on that though um, as with anything HR uh, the word consistent um, setting precedence these are all buzzwords that we often use in, in our uh, field um, so it's really important that businesses are fully aware of what it, um, you know what they're accommodating and if they're accommodated for one employee then they need to be asking why they wouldn't accommodate it for another, obviously in line with business needs. So it's just important to make sure you've got a consistent practice in place. So in terms of uh, types of requests, so you know this can cover a multitude of, of different scenarios and, and situations for, for different employees and businesses. Um, most typically you've got your part-time working which will that feed in with like job shares for example um, and then probably more in line with what's going on at the moment with, with current situations home working flexible hours staggered hours compressed working time 
they're all things that are probably happening in every one well, in a lot of businesses um, at the moment taking into consideration that the current pandemic that we're in uh, weekend work might also be um, a request that may start coming through um, as, as people are trying to um, spread out their hours um, and that certainly those that are currently home schooling uh, may be considering working over the weekend where um, it just gives them a little bit more flexibility and where they can fit all that work in. Um, but other um, types of requests, things like term, to, uh, term time, um, uh, annualised hours, um, asking for sabbaticals, uh, taking a, a chunk of time out of work, um, and then time off for study. Um, you know, and please have a statutory right to request time off for study where it's relevant to the position um, that they are in. So there's lots of different types of requests uh, that could be submitted by an employee, and um, some that may happen informally, not through a formal arrangement, um, and some that will require a little bit more consideration, especially the, where businesses don't naturally uh, work in, in that way. So if we talk about the process um, and, and what would happen during um, a process of request, so that ideally should be made in writing. Uh, the employee should clearly state what it is that they are um, wanting to, to do in terms of changing their hours. Um, and then um, the employer has to consider that request. They need to look at the business needs and see whether or not they can accommodate the request. Now, in terms of submitting the request in writing, a lot of employers will just accept a letter or an email. Um, one thing you could do uh, to make your procedure a little bit more robust and so that you can guarantee a certain quality of information that you're receiving from the employee is to um, implement a form, flexible working request form. And that will ask a list of questions that you want answers to. And the obvious is obviously going to be, well, what is it that you want uh, to change your hours to? Um, but more importantly, from a business perspective, and this will help you when you start going into the process in more detail, um, is what impact is their request going to have on the business? And secondly, if there is an impact on the business, what suggestions can they come up with to alleviate that impact? Um, and by asking those questions, you're taking away their tunnel vision of, I want this, this is what's going to work for me, um, and move it into, okay, so you want this, um, these hours, but how is it going to impact your colleagues? How is it going to impact the workload in your department? And therefore, how is it going to impact the business in, in general? And you have that information before you even sit down with them, and that will help. Um, work through when you're having the, the meeting with them, you have a better understanding of what's going through their mind in terms of have they really considered um, the impact to, to their team, to their colleagues and to the, um, to the wider function or are they just really thinking for themselves, which obviously we can't blame them, it is their request and, and their life, but um, from a business perspective we need to make sure it fits. Um, so that's just a, a bit of a hint, a tip in, in terms of how to maybe um, make it a little bit more robust. So have the meeting. Um, I mean, in terms of when you get the request, if it's something that you can accommodate straight away, absolutely no changes, no negotiation, no alternatives, and you can do this on a permanent basis, then I wouldn't necessarily say that you need to have a meeting. Some businesses will, as a matter of course, for consistency purposes, but I wouldn't necessarily say that you have to have um, a, a meeting in, in, in every case. Where though you may need to have some discussion um, a, around the request, it might well be that we could accommodate part of it but not all of it um, and those kind of uh, situations then a meeting should take place because we're not necessarily just accommodating it as it is. Um, as we had already established, it is a statutory right, and therefore the business is obliged to consider the uh, request in line with business needs. Um, and you need to make sure that you are um, evidencing what considerations uh, you, you are looking at. Um, and when you are providing an outcome, whatever that outcome may be, it should be done in writing. And if you're not able to offer um, exactly what the employee is uh, requesting, then the right of appeal should be provided as well. All in all, the process um, should be uh, completed within three months. And it's important to note as well that if, um, regardless of, of what the outcome may be, once that process is concluded, there is no further right to request, 
within another 12 month period. So um, in terms of looking at the request and what we can uh, accommodate and not accommodate, um, ACAS are really, really clear in terms of uh, guiding employers on reasons why they may not be able to accommodate a request. Um, and it's quite structured. I'm not going to read all of those eight reasons, um, but it is quite clear um, that they are um, good, solid business case reasons. Um, if we take one as an example, um, there, there will be a negative effect on the business's ability to meet customer demand. If you are using that as a way to decline a request, we can't just put that in the outcome. It needs to be more detailed. We need to provide some background to it. What is it that is impacting that customer demand? Is it because we don't have enough staff members at that time? Um, you know, does it tie in with another reason that the, the inability to recruit more staff maybe? And that's the combination of the two issues as to why we can't accommodate the request. But the more information we can provide, not only will that help the employee understand the reason behind it, rather than just thinking you've not really considered it and um, you've not taken it seriously, um, but it will also help from an appeals officer perspective because when they come to it, if they've got a really good paper trail of notes and considerations and they can see what you've looked at and keep your evidence that you've used, then it will be a lot easier for them to review it at that later stage. Um, other things that we can uh, consider at that stage in terms of um, why we might not be able to accommodate is can we maybe look at it on a trial basis? Does it have to be that we can't do it at all? Maybe if we could consider offering it on a trial period, we can actually demonstrate the impact better when it comes to declining the request. We can show the impact um, more clearly. Um, but nothing, if nothing else, it actually shows that you are taking the request seriously um, and that you are considering um, the, the request in line with what the business needs are at the time. Um, other options may, uh, may be relevant. Um, so if we're talking about caring um, uh, responsibilities, parental leave might be an alternative. Um, it's not necessarily full and flexible working request uh, there. Um, but an employee is entitled to take up to 18 weeks leave up to the child's 18th birthday and um, they can do so once they've qualified a 12 month service with a business. It is unpaid uh, but they can do so in blocks of a week um, for a maximum of four weeks per year. Um, so it is something that's there that can be used uh, to help alleviate maybe childcare issues, certainly during maybe school holidays um, and so forth. Um, it is a statutory right again. And whilst a business can defer the, the leave if it's not um, suitable at the time, they can't actually decline it. So if an employee has requested it, it has to be honoured at some point um, in, in that year. Um, other forms of leave, uh, time off due to dependence, obviously there are some emergencies. Um, but going back to actually parental leave, um, an exception to that would be um, for children that are uh, disabled, they can take the leave in blocks of one day rather than blocks of a week. So it's ideal um, where there's a lot of hospital appointments. So if, um, uh, I don't know, if a, if a member of staff is coming back from maternity leave and has a child who has a medical condition and is concerned, and that's why they're looking at trying to reduce their hours because they know they're going to have hospital appointments, this is another option that's maybe less um, of an impact on the business on a day-to-day, -day, but still within the realms of what their statutory rights are, and that might be enough to support them. Uh, another form of leave is shared parental leave that was introduced back in 2015. Um, that was so that both, part, so both parents who have parental responsibility can share maternity. Um, is a little bit more flexibility uh, for, for either party to help facilitate childcare during that first year. Um, and, and maybe able to prepare uh, better for, for when that child maybe needs to go to a nursery or to be cared by other relatives. So there's lots of options to consider uh, where we can't necessarily just outright um, accept a request. Um, but it's looking at the, the point of the meeting is to go through that request in more detail, try and get a really good understanding of what the concerns are with the employees' um, hours currently, what their constraints are, um, you know, does it have to be a Wednesday that they take off, for example, if Wednesdays are your busiest day? Um, so that discussion will really help understand 
uh, the query better and then it will help you um, make a better informed decision as a result. So some important considerations, um, so I've already covered it, but it's something that I think I cover off in every single training session I ever do, is the paper trail. Uh, tribunals love a good paper trail and it's the only way really we can evidence what's happened and if we don't have a paper trail, it's like it never happened. So uh, from a defence perspective, you can't go wrong if you keep detailed notes. Um, as a matter of course, I would say, regardless of the type of meeting you're having, whether it's an informal or a formal discussion, I would take notes. Um, and if you're not very good at capturing notes, I'd have a note taker in with you. There's absolutely no reason why you can't do that. Or tell the employee you want to record the meeting, uh, but just make sure you've got a good um, recording of that discussion uh, that you can refer back to. And then it's also really good to um, ensure that you um, evidence your um, considerations. So what is it you've looked at? Um, have you looked at a workforce forecast to, to consider how many employees you've got in at the moment, how many employees you're going to need? Now, I know things are a little bit up in the air at the moment, given the, the COVID um, outbreak, but um, in normal times, um, as I'm hoping we will get back there at some point, um, you will be able to forecast a lot over a longer period and you may be able to look back at previous um, uh, requirements to, to gauge what you need um, as a, in the workforce place. Um, statute is a statutory right, so again, um, like any statutory right, an employee can't be placed at a detriment for, a, uh, for uh, making a request. If they are dismissed as a result, if um, they are passed over for promotion as a result, then they would have um, a cause to potentially bring a, a claim to tribunal. Uh, in most likely cause, it would be constructive dismissal or unfair dismissal, but it would be considered as an automatic. And the other consideration there is disability risk. We do need to be really careful um, when we're looking at um, whether or not we can accommodate and what it is um, that is being requested. Um, so disability from a medical condition, discrimination by association, um, something that people don't always pick up on, but obviously if um, a member of their family as a protected um, characteristic, then they themselves can claim discrimination by association. They don't actually have to hold the protected characteristic themselves. And then sex discrimination, um, it, it is still uh, more common for females to request flexible working over their male counterparts. It's not, obviously, it's getting uh, more broad because obviously uh, now everybody can request uh, flexible working for whatever reason. Um, however, from a childcare perspective, it's still um, seen as, as the female who tends to uh, to do that um, and therefore we do need to be mindful of potential sex discrimination claims. Just touching back on the disability, um, one thing that I would consider as well is if the person's requesting flexible working but it's because of a medical condition, I would put probably consider that more under reasonable adjustments requests. Um, and um, maybe look to obtain a medical report, get a better understanding of that medical condition, understand um, you know, what it is that they need and how that's going to work for the business, um, but also to make sure that what you are going to implement is going to support them in the best way. Um, you know, I would never put myself in a position where I'm making assumptions on someone's medical condition as I'm not medically qualified, and therefore um, it's, it's really um, useful um, to obtain that medical report. Um, from experience, uh, occupational health tend to be the best um, just because they are focused more around role um, assessments rather than GPs. GPs are really good um, to, to help with where, there's like where, where there isn't a diagnosis and they can talk about what treatment they've been having and maybe how that might impact their ability to do certain things during the day, they're a bit more their daily uh, duties. Um, but from a work perspective, occupational health are, are a much better place. It may be that we do need to touch it base with a specialist if, um, if they've been referred there, they may not really talk to their GP much uh, depending on the circumstances and therefore um, a specialist might be more um, relevant in, in that respect. Uh, but certainly if you have somebody who wants to request a change to their hours of work, uh, the working pattern and they claim it's because of a medical condition um, and we need to be really, really careful with that um, because the claims um, in relation to that can be quite significant um, and there has been an uplift in claims for and to put reasonable adjustments in place. So um, just a, a costly mistake that can be quite easily avoided there. 
So going to present day, COVID-19, um, I think we're all sick of hearing that now, um, along with um, furlough and, and other buzzwords that seem to be popping up. Um, we won't mention the, the MP's name today. Um, but also in terms of um, how that's impacting uh, flexible working, um, well, we need to be on top of this now. We need to be looking at how we can get ahead of the game. Um, so you may have um, joined in uh, my colleague Jenny Hayes' uh, webinar a couple of weeks ago on getting your house in order. And that was all about trying to plan um, and getting ahead of the game, having some strategy in place. This is a little bit similar, um, but more from um, managing your workforce um, availability and um, the health and safety um, and, and just the, the the issues that are going to happen over these next few weeks whilst we're, we're all trying to still find our way um, through this very very strange time so I think you know it's important to look at you know what's changed uh, for the workforce so you know those that have been furloughed what's changed they're not in work and the, the, the transgression will be to get them back into the workplace and to do so safely and that will involve a risk assessment um, to, to make sure that the, the business has got everything in place. What that might mean though is that their normal hours of work are not going to fit uh, because from a health and safety perspective it's just going to mean that we're going to end up with a big uh, group of people at nine o'clock in the morning and a big group of people at five o'clock in the evening and that's just going to cause um, risk um, to, to the employees. So it may well be that we need to start looking at hours of work so that that's more staggered um, and, and, and people are a little bit more flexible in that way. That might actually work well as well with people with childcare responsibilities because at the moment we're all still in a situation, um, don't know about everybody else, but I've still got my seven year old at home um, and it's likely to looking to be the case till September, I think, um, looking at things at the moment. Um, and therefore, this is still a big impact on our lives personally um, and, and, and businesses do need to take that into consideration. So when we've been looking at those that have been lucky enough to be able to continue working from a home working perspective, we need to look at what's worked and what's not worked and what can be put in place and can we make some adjustments um, so that that, can, that role can continue in that way for the foreseeable. Um, and and you know, do they have to do their hours at the time that the business states that they have to do their hours? We talked about that weekend working, can, can that happen? Do they have to be present Monday to Friday? Um, could they block out certain parts of the day so they're available for calls, for example? Um, and then there's other parts of the day where um, it, it's more um, focused time and they can just get their head down and, and do um, work. Um, and that might mean that we're having to condense hours a little bit and, and change it up a little bit, but it means that we can continue working whilst being reasonable. And I do believe those employers that go that extra step and support those um, colleagues will come out of this better than those that don't um you know they, they will be the employer of choice um you know when when it comes to looking at recruitment and retention um going forward that reputation soon gets out um you know you, you hear of businesses and, and we've heard of some um you know a lot of the the factory or well, the manufacturing and uh, the distribution centers early on in the lockdown period where they were probably one of the only businesses that were still functioning on a large scale and a lot of employees were raising those concerns around social distancing and that they didn't feel safe and and that's a big thing it's about making them feel safe in the workplace but also um you know being able to still function as a business and, and therefore it's all very fluid and we need to adapt and work more agile in trying to to achieve that common goal for everybody so it's about having a plan, try and put a plan in place, um, albeit maybe a short term plan um, so that we can try and ensure that we can get staff in, um, albeit maybe on a more flexible basis, certainly in the short to medium term. So the new normal, is this going to be the new normal or is it going to be that we get to go back to normal as we knew it before? <laughs> It's on Twitter. Um, so, I mean, in terms of old ways of working, uh, the large number of organisations were very much against home working. Um, if, we, if we take that as an example, um, they didn't really like the flexible um, elements. They felt that they were lost control 
other employees, they didn't think they would be able to monitor the performance as well. Um, but here we are in 2020, um, about I think three, I mean, three months, four months into this uh, strange situation where we're all sat in bedrooms and, uh, uh, and living rooms uh, trying to find our way through work and, and we're all doing it. Um, and a lot of businesses are, are actually suggesting that it's worked very, very well um, to the point where they might not go back. Um, to that old way of working and um, you know I, I was on a webinar um, last week and uh, with two senior HR professionals very large organizations who have said it's worked really really well and actually they're actively encouraging the management team to look at this on a more long-term basis to move away from that structured nine to five office environment. Um, in, in any case, that office environment is not going to look the same when we all do manage to return due to us needing to socially distance. And you know, the, the experts are suggesting that this situation could go on for several years, um, you know, through peaks and troughs. So we need to be thinking on the long term of how we can try and adapt so that we can get the best out of our staff, that they are still motivated and engaged in their work um, but also um, that uh, we're able to um, accommodate um, where we need to so that we are working as a business and still functioning and getting the best um, for, for, um, uh, for our staff. So I mean in terms of going further you know can we look at other things well we've we've been dealing with um, Zoom and Microsoft Teams um, and, 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 and things like that over the last few months but is there other things that could be considered um, that we haven't already uh, looking at hardware um, and, and looking at alternative um, so social distancing um, systems to put in place to support the workforce um, and we need to be considering you know what impact it's going to have on our clients and suppliers um, you know is that going to delay um, our ability to meet uh, deadlines and, and agreements so we need to be thinking of what we need to put in place to, to support that um, and I guess really the big question is well has it actually changed our attitude to flexible working or well, I do think it has in a lot of cases I think a lot more people appear to be open to um, flexible working and it does have a lot of benefits um, you know it does enable better work-life balance it can help reduce stress and pressure that people experience um, and and it is it's a known factor um, when employees are deciding whether or not they want to remain with their current employer. Um, so it's a really good retention tool. Um, you know, whilst remuneration is probably still one of the top things that employees look at when it comes to choosing and selecting uh, their place of work, um, I do think that um, that flexibility, I think people are more uh, demanding themselves or wanting that work home life balance so looking at uh, what could be put in place to support that uh, really is quite important um, and you know in terms of an opportunity um, here we have got a great opportunity there's lots of things um, that, that can benefit from working more flexibly um, it might well be that you're able to operate over longer hours uh, you might be able to reach uh, further in terms of um, recruitment and attracting more talent um, so there's lots of positives from, from working more flexibly but it doesn't always work so if home working for example isn't going to work for every business and those that work in a manufacturing environment for example we can't send them all working home with um, a box of, of items to pack we, you know there, there needs to be some structure there and therefore it might well be that we just need to look at the hours of work that we offer and whether there's some flexibility um, on, on that does it need to be a structured shift pattern as it has known to be in the past so I mean in terms of um, looking at this now from a on a flip side so this this is really like helping you support um, going back into the workplace um, and what we want to um, to do is look at how that's going to work and talking back to when we were saying about trying to plan ahead and have a bit of a mini strategy uh, to, to aid that it may well be that when we consider coming back to the workplace we might not be able to come back in the way that we were um, so if we take retail as an example um, you know retail was hoping to return um, from non-essential shops pretty much by the 15th of June 
with other businesses um, being expected to open at the beginning of July. However, we don't really know what this is going to look like. We don't know whether there's going to be a mad surge of people wanting to visit these places or whether people are going to be really reluctant. It may well be that we need to put more controls on, so it might be that we need to adjust our opening times. Um, and whilst a lot of these kind of establishments might have staff on varied hour contracts and, and have that flexibility built in, some businesses might not. Some businesses may have staff on structured hours and therefore conversation may need to take place around temporary variation of contracts. So with any kind of change, it's really important that we seek agreements, that we try and get them to understand why we want to make that change, um, how long it's going to last for as well is really crucial so they understand it's not forever. Um, and just be really open with them, you know, the more transparent you can be, then the more you're going to get that buy-in from them. Um, I would hope in this current situation that actually we're, we're going to get a lot of members of staff on board with these kind of things um, and we're not going to fa be faced with the usual challenge of trying to uh, get people to agree um, to, to maybe like a slight reduction in hours or a just a change in, in their, their hours of work. But we do need to still consider their own personal circumstances as we would do normally. Um, and, and that might be because uh, a childcare, um, you know, isn't in a great position. Certainly at the moment, that's going to be a potential issue. Um, and, and other, other matters, um, their own concerns, um, whether they've got people chilled in and stuff and, and therefore there's still an opportunity to keep them on that furlough for example at this time, um, then that might be an option that you'll consider and you may decide to, to utilise some other members of staff who don't have those same restrictions. Um, but it's really important, uh, make sure you document it so you need to write to them and get them to sign to agreement. But similar, I guess, to, to when we did the, the furlough agreement. Um, but keep it under review and make sure that you're keeping the workforce informed um, if you do need to make any further changes. And again, you'll need to get further agreement on that. Um, and finally, uh, lay off and short time working. So, I mean, this we always consider this as a last resort. This is one step before redundancy. And this is probably going to be more relevant when we're starting to see uh, the CJRS come to an end where, uh, you know, there's going to be more obligation on the employer to put more in the pot, um, so to speak. And if though that employer is still not up and running as it, as it needs to be, then there's going to be some further discussions had but it is a good way to try and avoid redundancy. Um, in terms of um, the, the restrictions, so there's no um, maximum period of time that someone could be placed on layoff or short time working. Um, however, really, really important to note that if you've got an employee with over two years service, that if then they've been on either or for four weeks or more in a row, or six weeks or more in a 13 week period, then they can claim statutory redundancy. Now, they would need to resign to do that. Um, and, and therefore the hope is that given the situation, the uncertainty of, the, uh, of uh, recruitment to be able to get an alternative job, that they wouldn't do that, um, but it is there, it's a risk. And therefore if you've got a lot of long service employees where your redundancy costs are gonna be quite expensive, then that's something you do need to take into consideration. Uh, we also need to be bearing in mind in terms of discrimination risk as well when we're selecting those to go on this type of leave but we, we are not doing so uh, because we've got somebody with a medical condition who's always off all the time and uh, we can't be selecting them or we can't select all the women or all the men. Uh, we need to be really uh, mindful of, of how we're selecting employees. Uh, similar to uh, the furlough situation where, we were, uh, where it's been announced you know people can go and work elsewhere if if the contract allows, the same applies here. If it's an agreement with the employer, then they can go and work elsewhere whilst they're in this um, period of leave. Um, but it is there as, as an alternative and it might just bridge the gap whilst you're trying to get everybody back in and understanding what your needs are before you actually jump straight into a full on redundancy um, process with, with work uh, with staff members. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've covered off everything you know, from a flexible working perspective, I um, hope um, that that covers off um, a little bit more information around maybe getting you to think about what uh, might be coming up in, in the next few months. Um, so, move on to questions. Um, I know my colleague said we, we do have other opportunities uh, for questioning if it's more in depth. Just see if there's any up here.
there's a question here. So uh, where changes made to hours or, or working structures, uh, should that be um, a, a change to their contract? So, yeah, I mean, anybody who is, is required, well, it's, it's, if they're requesting a change, it would be under flexible working and it would be deemed as a change to contract. So when you do your outcome, that would usually, there's two options of doing it. We can either issue them with an up-to-date contract to reflect the changes, or we could do an amendment to the contract letter uh, that states that this is the new change to their hours um, and, and therefore that's, um, what's going to be reflective going forward. Um, the details into how I would normally present that letter, we're doing it as a, as a variation letter, is I put what they're currently doing, what the proposed new hours are going to be, anything else that's affected, so holidays, pension, contributions, etc. And then I'd also put a sentence in to say that all other terms and conditions remain unchanged. And then to say that I sign to agree to this change of terms and conditions. It also needs to state whether it's temporary or permanent. If it's temporary, it needs to clearly state the date uh, that it's, it's going to end and that they will revert back to their current terms and conditions at the end of that, uh, that period. Or if it's um, because we're doing it on a trial period, for example, as we discussed as an option to try and avoid saying no straight away, um, then an option there would be to say we will review this and we'll have a further meeting on this date. So again, inviting them almost back to that meeting at that, on that date for that further review. Uh, but yeah, any, any changes um, to, to hours or working pattern is certainly considered as a, as a change. Um, I think that was the only question we had actually. So um, that's the end of, um, of, of my uh, presentation on the place we're working this morning. Um, just to give you some more um, information, um, the HR3 team, um, ATG and People Projects are all running um, hub integration, uh, reintegration sessions. They are free, uh, 30 minutes long on a one-to-one. -one. You can select one, two or three experts of your choice um, to, to chat through any concerns that you have about uh, what's going on at the moment, about your concerns about getting back into the workplace, possibly about flexible working if that, if that is a, an issue um, at the moment. Um, but that they're a really uh, useful uh, resource. We also have um, a number of webinars. So um, they are usually advertised on LinkedIn. Um, they're on the website. If you have any interest in any of them, just register like you have done today um, and, and jump on the covering a range of subjects across the firm. So um, anything from employment related um, to maybe managing wills to um, director protection um, to, to corporate matters. Um, so there's a number of different subjects there. And then finally, uh, my colleague and I, Jenny Hayes, uh, we have been running some HR community sessions. Our third one is going to be on Monday, the 1st of June at 11. We'd love to see some more faces. Um, they're really, really useful. Um, a great um, resource there for, for HR professionals, maybe those that are on a standalone position and, and maybe just need to share some concerns, maybe want to just... Um, ask for some suggestions, some ideas, share best practice, but it's a safe space, um, we, we don't record it and uh, we do limit numbers to 25 so that we can make sure that it's quite inclusive. So if you are interested in there, um, jump on um, to, um, uh, to, to the website and, and register your interest um, and we can take it from there. I'll just check something else that pops up. Oh, that's I see Jenny's uh, answered that query. That's great. Right. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, we will be sending out a uh, recording of today's session. So if you do want to uh, listen back. But as ever, if you've got any questions, if there's any burning issues, if you've got any example uh, matters um, that you want to talk through, then by all means contact me. You can find me on LinkedIn. All my contact details are on uh, the Nathan's website. Um, but other than that, thank you very much again and uh, we'll, we'll leave it there. See you. Bye.